Cracking the Code viewers, it is good to see you again. We have been super busy building out our new membership website, which has all kinds of features that we have wanted for a really long time. Interactive tablature, synchronized video and tab using the Sound Slice player. We have a new forum, which has been an incredible learning experience. As you can probably also see, we have also been busy building out our brand new, ta-da, Cracking the Code Studio. This is the first time that we have actually had a private space of our own where we can film our stuff um, without uh, the, the potential danger of a punk band starting up in the next room. Our previous space, which was great and, and we used for years, uh, was a shared rehearsal studio space. And you never quite knew what was gonna come through the wall at any given moment when you're halfway through an interview. We actually managed to pull off one live interview there, which was the Badio meeting that we did earlier this and year. With Helen, but with the new space, we really hope to be able to be a lot freer to invite people over to play with our toys and to play with blocks and Legos and to talk about guitar playing and harmony and learning and technique and all the things that we're interested in in cracking the code. And in coincidence with all this renovation that we've been up to, it has occurred to us that a storied ritual that happens once a year is once again upon us. And this is, of course, Black Friday. So we have put together a selection of Black Friday deals that relate to the new membership platform, to the new website. We have some subscription offers coming up. We have um, some interview bundles and download bundles for those of you who like to buy download copies of our interviews. And I should note that when you do that, we split those, uh, those dollars with the artists themselves. So you're not just supporting us, you're also supporting the great players who have been gracious enough to sit down with us and to be so revealing um, and sharing of their own technique. One such player is one of the earlier interviews that we did that we'd never really given the full interview treatment as we now do it. And this is the incredible Mike Stern. Mike was one of the first players that I met back with the old camera rig that I used to have. And when we originally edited his material, we had not yet settled on the interview format that we currently use. And instead we just extracted all the musical clips, all the examples that Mike played and bundled them together as kind of a pack of what we now call clips. But we didn't really know what to do with the interview itself, and we certainly didn't have a place to display it like we do now. So it's about time that we went back to some of these uh, incredible older meetings that I've done and given them their proper place uh, on display on the new platform. In Mike's case, we've been having a lot of really interesting conversations on the forum about harmony and improvisation. And the Mike interview is a really great window into how a true master applies that art. So I think it's about time that we finally take a look at that meeting again. We'll be incorporating um, Mike's interview onto the platform probably over the next week or so in time for the deals emails, which will be going out shortly. And oh, by the way, if you are interested in receiving such notifications from us, the way to do that is to get on our mailing list. Head over to TroyGrady.com, hit any page on the site. There's a little banner at the top where you can subscribe to the mailing list. There's so many great things to say about the meeting with Mike, so much cool stuff in it, so many great ideas on display. And for this lesson, I picked out one of them, which I thought was particularly cool. Really cool, right? This is from a Miles Davis tune called Fat Time. It was on The Man With A Horn that came out in 1981. Mike was in the band, Marcus Miller, an incredibly funky, soulful crew. I mean, Miles Davis was sort of famous for his ability to assemble these amazing players and to be kind of the catalyst for, for the, the inspiration. And um, this, I forget how I stumbled upon this lick, but I remembered hearing it in the tune, and then when I met Mike, I actually asked him to play it, and he, he remembered it, and he, he thought for a second, he looked up at the ceiling, and then he just started doing it. It was really cool to watch that. Um, and so I, I think the first thing to ask is, like, what is, I mean, it sounds cool, sure, but what is the point of this? What are we doing here? Well, what's happening is we've got, um, and I'm gonna do this, let's do this in G. We've got this, I'll play that here. tritone action happening, a very tasty tritone sound. What's happening is, 
happening here is Phrygian. We've taken the tonic, which in this case I'm saying, let's say it's in G, and this is our one chord, playing it up here using the C major shape. In other words, the same shape that you would use fingering-wise to play a C major chord, but we're gonna play it up here on the neck. So I'm barring, and then I'm doing this. So this is our one chord, and if you remember your three-string arpeggio shapes that all the shred guys like to play, the Ingve style shapes. Here's your, your three fingers here, and then you use the pinky to play the five of the chord. Right. Now, what would happen if you took the three fingers, the three fretting fingers, and slid them up one half step, but did not move the pinky? Really neat, right? You get Phrygian. So in other words, you've got your one chord and then the chord one half step above it, also being major, is one of the hallmarks of the Phrygian mode, key, scale, however you want to think about it. Flavor of major, <laughs> if you want to think of it that way. In other words, your tonic is a major chord, so I actually classify the Phrygian mode in my mind. I sort of file it away with all the different ways I can play major. And in this particular shape, you have this very cool mechanical possibility, basically, which Mike has hit upon, where you take a very common and easy four finger or four fret stretch, and you alter it very slightly to create this really neat tritone sound. And mechanically, it's like easy to do, right? So many of these things on, uh, on guitar are shape driven, or, or they're mechanically driven, where you come up with a cool line because it fits a certain way on the fretboard. <laughs> But the, the importance of this, and the reason why I think this is a really cool phrase, is because of the problem that it solves. This neat little kind of subversion of the key, turn, taking the tune and all of a sudden making it a Phrygian dominant, Phrygian dominant's the word phrase I was looking for, Phrygian dominant, turning the tune from basically minor blues groove into Phrygian dominant is a very subversive thing to do. Why would you do it? Well, you would do it because it solves a problem that we encounter all the time in improvisational playing, and that is playing through the changes when there are no changes, right? In the intro tune, um, the intro solo thing that I came up with for this lesson, I specifically came up with a groove that doesn't change. In other words, it's just, in that case, it's A, right? A all the time. just A forever. And it's pretty sparse. There's just kind of a bass going. It's the kind of scenario that you would encounter probably all the time if you're doing rock stuff or blues. And the question becomes, what do you play over that? If it's a complicated jazz tune like Giant Steps, you've got a million chords flying by and it, it already kind of suggests to you some of the possibilities for things that you should play. But what if there are no chords flying by? What if it's just one chord all the time? How do you get variety out of that? And what Mike is showing us here is that when there are no chords and the backing track is sparse enough, as it is in, that, in the tune Fat Time, that's actually creating possibility for you because you, the lead player, can create or superimpose whatever chord progression you want on the underlying tune. And so what Mike is doing here is taking just sort of very sparse root tonic kind of bass idea. <laughs> interpreting it as Phrygian dominant. All right, so he's doing it with alternate picking, which is really cool, and here's the two-way pick slanting concept at play. The first two notes are down up with the downward pick slanting orientation. And what that does is it leaves the pick in the air above the B string. Then we can hit the tonic or the root note on the B string. And that's when we're going to be a little bit stuck. If we do that, kind of like this. So far, this all works out great with the downward pick slanting methodology. You've got down up, the upstroke is in the air, and then we come down onto the 
the middle finger here on the root. But now we're kind of like locked in here. How do we get out of here? We do it, if we watch what Mike is doing, we do it with two-way pixelanting. You turn the hand and come back like that. So the whole sequence then looks like this. So it's down, up, down, rotate. And then when you play that last note, you rotate back. So it's kind of like a back-to-back -back turning of the hand, almost like motorcycle grip type. And it can be done reasonably fast, but speed isn't really what we're going for here. Instead, what we're shooting for is smooth, smoothness. When Mike plays this lick, it just repeats endlessly, looping over itself, over the top of the bed of the groove. Here's what it, let's, let's listen to it again. So I would start out practicing these movements in a g with a gentle attack at a moderate speed, shooting for s the smoothest possible um, articulation, or perhaps lack thereof. I'm not thinking about the movements that I'm making here. In fact, I'm specifically trying not to think, to think about them, even though intellectually I know that they are necessary in order to, to do these last two notes here, to make these two notes work. But I'm sort of trying to defocus my brain on that and instead focus on the smoothness. And the important point here, I think, is that it is sometimes valuable enough simply to know that a thing is necessary and then try and forget about it. There's a big difference between that and not knowing how to do this at all. Back in the day, I would have had no understanding of how to play this kind of line, how to make it work with picking. It just would have felt awful and sticky. But now that I know how to do this, um, even if I'm gonna try and let my natural body mechanics take over to play this line, at least I'm kind of seeding the cloud, as it were. I'm giving myself kind of this hint that there's a movement that needs to happen between these two bottom strings. The other thing that I like to do to promote smoothness when I'm practicing this line, and, and actually with a lot of mechanical lines that repeat, is to try and find a rhythmic way of thinking about it that is different from the number of notes in the actual repeating pattern, the physical pattern. In other words, this is a pattern of four notes and therefore I have to make four picking movements to do it. So it would be natural to say, okay, I'm going to practice this like 16th notes or 8th or something, where it's very da 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 But I find that when you have a repeating pattern where the first note matches up exactly with the time, and especially if that first note is a downstroke, I have a tendency to hit that note hard. And this is, um, it's kind of a vestige of a lot of the ways that I've learned to have hand synchronization by playing things like where I'm kind of, at some level, accenting the first note of that six note pattern. And that is a, an aid, it's a cognitive aid to helping to build hand synchronization. But when you're doing some of these complicated movements, especially if they involve turning to a pixelanting stuff or jumping across the strings, that accent can force you to dig in a little bit more than you would like and apply too much tension, and that tension can make it harder to learn these more complicated movements. So instead what I do is I try and think of the rhythm as a different denominator, if you will, than fours or eights. In this case, let's go with threes, right? So I try to think about this as triplets against a four type of count, and those two things don't really line up, right? So instead of... And now it's, that's fours, right? One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, like sixteenths. But what if we do triplets? All 
right? So it's a one, two, three, 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 one, two, three. Now I'm accenting those notes so that you can hear it, but actuality. You want to try and not accent those notes. And the fact that the downstroke now no longer really lines up with the foot tap, not every time, makes it a little easier, I think, to forget that there's that link happening there. Let's try that again. Right? And because it's a four note pattern and you're counting in threes, that means 12 notes are going to have to go by before that downstroke actually matches up with the downbeat again. At least the downstroke on the pinky that starts the pattern. And I actually like the feel of this displaced accent. To me, it actually takes the focus off this very heavy handed like kind of pounding or stomping on the downstroke and it makes it easier for me to focus on the smoothness or perhaps not focus on the smoothness of the movement. Okay, so that's the two-way pick slanting approach and I hear what you're saying. It is a little bit involved. You're doing actual one note per string alternate picking across the strings to play an arpeggio figure, which is a bit exotic, right? There are relatively few players outside of Mike that attempt this. Steve Morse is sort of famous for that. But you may not want to do that for whatever reason. You may not have that technique yet, or you might not want to work on it. So does that mean you're out of luck? Can you not join the Phrygian arpeggio party? Well, no, of course you can. There are lots of other ways that you can take the kernel of this idea and implement it using whatever systems you're currently familiar with. So if you can't hack the mechanical side of this, then by all means hack the melodic side of it to get it to fit whatever technique you have now. That's really, I think, uh, kind of an important takeaway just for improvisation in general. Having or not having a particular technique should never be an impediment to building out your musical vocabulary. Great music can be made at all levels of technical ability, including whatever level you currently have right now, even if you don't think so. So Mike, thanks for this very cool kick in the pants that um, helps us play some interesting stuff in situations where we may have not particularly previously considered that such interesting things were possible. There's a lot more of this coming up in the Mike Stern interview. And um, if you are interested in receiving our Black Friday deals, please do get on our mailing list. We will begin sending out that stuff in a couple days and we'll have uh, Mike's edited interview up on the website within a week. And thanks so much as always for watching Cracking the Code.